Hey everyone, welcome to Cinematic Excrement. Today we have another Worst Picture winner on the docket, and this one is a bit confusing. Not that the movie itself is confusing, mind you, it's actually quite simple. What confuses me is how Cocktail won Worst Picture. Don't get me wrong, this is a bad movie. That's not really in dispute. It has a 5% on Rotten Tomatoes, and out of 43 reviews, only two are what the site considers positive. One of those two reviews is listed with the quote, Yeah, it's watchable. And if that's not damning with faint praise, I don't know what is. Nevertheless, I can't really argue with that assessment. I have seen this movie several times now, and it is indeed watchable. That's a low bar I know, but it's true. Since I have started this worst picture project, I have seen some real stinkers, and Cocktail doesn't even come close to the likes of Inchon, or Bolero, or Leonard Part 6. So, what exactly makes it Razzie material? Let's take a closer look. Cocktail stars a young Tom Cruise as Brian Flanagan, who apparently just got out of the army, and his first act as a free man is to pile into a car with five of his buddies so they can pull over a bus and he can get on. Seems like an awful lot of trouble to go through because you couldn't get to the bus station on time. Apparently, the army didn't teach you anything about punctuality. Which is odd. He heads home to New York City. Yeah! and tries to get a job on Wall Street. But no one is willing to hire him because he has no college degree or relevant work experience. Apparently, it never occurred to him that this might be a problem. You mean you actually have to go to school and learn stuff before people will just hand you their hard-earned money? Oh, the devil, you say! His uncle has a friend who can hook Brian up with the job, but he turns it down because he's stupid. It was good enough for your old man. So is arthritis. So... No sense of punctuality, no idea how the world works, a disdain for manual labor, and no respect for his father. Our hero, ladies and gentlemen. After a long day of getting shot down in job interviews, he decides it might be time to aim a bit lower and tries to get a job behind the bar at a TGI Friday's. Here he meets Doug Coughlin, played by Brian Brown. Doug is the Obi-Wan to Brian's Luke, if Obi-Wan was an ornery old bastard and Luke was an egotistical clueless douche. We rarely see Doug without a cigarette and a drink, even when he's working or exercising, which is not as endearing as the movie thinks it is. I'll stick with the brew. Beer is for breakfast around here. Drink or be gone. I pity your poor liver. And he constantly spouts his own set of adages, which he calls Coughlin's Laws, because he's that far up his own ass. And the movie presents him as a font of wisdom when really he's just spouting nonsense. Bartender is the aristocrat of the working class. Is he, though? It has been a while since I've heard a statement that meant so little. The bartender is the aristocrat of the working class. And just so we're clear, I mean no disrespect to any bartenders out there. They work as hard as anyone else, and they're just trying to make an honest living like the rest of us. And they should be tipped well. But if you're tending bar at a TGI Friday's, you're not even the aristocrat of chain restaurant bartenders. But boy, does the movie want you to think tending bar is the greatest thing ever. It doesn't start off that way, mind you. Brian's first day is absolute hell. I've only ever been to New York once, and I was pretty young at the time, so I can't say I'm an expert on the place. But I have been in quite a few bars elsewhere in the country, and I've been to a TGI Friday's. And I have never seen anything like this. It looks like there's a good 30 people crowding the bar and just yelling their drink orders at the bartender instead of letting him come to them. Is everyone in New York an asshole? I can understand the waitresses yelling at him if he's falling behind, but everyone else is just being a jerk. Also, why are they going through so much trouble making this TGI Fridays look like a bar instead of what it actually is? A restaurant. Yeah, there's a bar in it, but that's not its primary function. So why does this not take place in an actual bar? They didn't film inside the TGI Fridays, the interior shots were done in a studio. So what's the point? Eventually, Brian gets the hang of this bartending thing, and he's throwing bottles into the air and singing and dancing around, and by golly, the people love him. I mean, they treat him like a goddamn rock star, which makes me wonder when New York adopted such a low standard for entertainment. Again, and I cannot stress this enough, he's working in a fucking TGI Fridays. No one is going to get this excited over a chain restaurant bartender. Hell, I've seen bartenders do this kind of flailed bartending shit in Vegas, and even they weren't getting cheered on like these two dickheads. 
Brian also enrolls at a local college to study finance because he does actually have aspirations outside of just serving drinks. But at some point, the movie just forgets about this because apparently Coughlin's Law says aspirations are for losers. The words bad influence seem woefully inadequate to describe Coughlin, and his friendship with Brian is quite bizarre. The two of them eventually start working at an actual bar where people spontaneously recite poetry. Really, really bad poetry. Again, I haven't spent much time in New York, but is this normal? Anyway, Brian gets himself a girlfriend, which for some reason, Coughlin has a huge problem with, and he decides the best way to fix this non-problem is to make a move on the girl himself. And she actually goes for it. Ew, what are you doing? He's almost old enough to be your father. Brian then tells Coughlin to get stuffed, to the surprise of no one except Coughlin. I mean, you stole his girl, what did you expect, asshole? And Brian ends up getting another bartending job in Jamaica, of all places. Somehow, Coughlin tracks him down, bringing along his new wife, who is even younger than the girl he stole from Brian. If this guy wasn't sketchy before, he certainly is now. Also, how much time has passed? If Coughlin is now married, I would assume at least a year or two, but it certainly doesn't feel like that long. Just how quickly did these two get married? And apparently his new bride's family is loaded, and they've given him money to start his own club in New York, and he wants to make Brian the head bartender. Ooh, head bartender. Moving on sideways. I've got plans of my own. Do you? Ultimately, Brian goes along with the idea, and now they're friends again. Just like that. I cannot make head or tail of this. Brian seems to be doing all right for himself in Jamaica, so why in God's name would he want to go back to New York and work for this clown? It's not like Coughlin has changed. He was an asshole then, and he's an asshole now. How do I know he's still an asshole? Well, Cocktail is not just a story about pouring drinks. It's also a love story. A really, really terrible love story. While bartending in Jamaica, Brian meets a girl named Jordan, played by Elizabeth Shue, and somehow she ends up falling for this low aspiration having motherfucker. And Brian seems to like the fact that she's not like Coughlin's wife, i.e. not just some spoiled rich girl from Manhattan. Oh gee, I wonder where this is going. But once again, Coughlin has to come along and screw everything up, and he makes a bet with Brian that he can't hook up with some older rich woman at the bar. Brian takes the bet because he's a fucking moron, and unbeknownst to him, Jordan witnesses the whole thing and promptly flies home the next day. Dude, you had Elizabeth's shoe. Why would you throw that away? You have officially drunk yourself stupid. Conveniently, Jordan also lives in New York, and when Brian returns home, he just happens to run into her and tries to patch things up. And he does a terrible job. Basically, his excuse is, well, Coughlin bet me that I couldn't take this rich bitch home, so I had to do it. Really, that's his excuse. Now, Coughlin is still an asshole for making the bet in the first place, that is not in dispute. But here's the thing, if somebody bets you, or dares you, or otherwise asks you to do something incredibly stupid, you don't actually have to do it! No one was putting a gun to your head, man. You could have and should have told him to piss off. Now, before we go any further with this bullshit love story, let's back up a bit. Early on in the movie, Brian's uncle tells him that he'll be raising a family of his own someday. But Brian seems to think otherwise. Not me. I am not falling into that trap. So what do you suppose happens to the guy who has no interest in starting a family? I'll give you three guesses. The first two don't count. I'm pregnant. I just gave birth. And surprise, surprise, it turns out Jordan's parents are loaded, and they try to give Brian $10,000 to go the fuck away. I know how they feel. But shockingly, he actually wants to take responsibility for his child. He even wants to marry Jordan, which seems like a terrible mistake. I've loved you from the first moment I saw you, Jordan. Oh, give me a break. I'm sure you wanted to bone her from the first moment you saw her, but that ain't love, Chief. And apparently they get married right away because she ain't even showing yet, and he ends up opening his own bar and they all live happily ever after. Except Coughlin who- OH JESUS! Yeah, apparently he blew his in-laws money on some bad investments and killed himself. And I might have sympathy for him if the movie gave me a reason to. 
And that's Cocktail. It's crap. The story is ridiculous, the main characters are unlikable asshats, and it's predictable as all hell. As soon as Brian says he's not falling into the trap of raising a family, you know exactly where he's going to end up. And that wouldn't be bad if the journey from point A to point B was interesting, but it's not. This journey is fantastically mediocre. Hell, that's a great way to describe the character of Brian Flanagan. Fantastically mediocre. So I am not about to argue that Cocktail is a bad movie. Even Cruz admitted it was not one of the highlights of his career. But to me, it just seems like an average bad film. There's nothing really remarkable about it. So how did the Golden Raspberry Foundation decide this should be the worst picture of 1988? It's not like it didn't have any competition. I mean, look at the other nominees. First, we have what we thought would be Sylvester Stallone's last outing as John Rambo until another movie surfaced almost 20 years later. And later this year, we'll get his actual last movie as Rambo. No, really, we mean it. It's got in for me sometime. Anyway, Rambo 3 finds our titular hero taking refuge in a monastery in Thailand. Colonel Troutman tracks him down easily because I'm sure there aren't too many muscle-bound white men in Thailand, and asks him to assist in a smuggling operation that will provide aid to the rebels fighting the Soviets in Afghanistan. Once again, they're trying to take a man with obvious PTSD and put him back into a war zone. Do these people never fucking learn? Rambo tells him to get lost, but Troutman goes ahead with the mission anyway. And for some reason, he's leading the mission himself, even though he's a goddamn colonel and pretty much two days away from retirement. Unsurprisingly, the Ruskies capture him with little trouble. So Rambo once again gears up for battle and goes on a rescue mission, helping out the Afghan rebels and killing some commies along the way. I'm not going to get into the argument about how the title makes no sense, because that's already been done to death and I really have nothing more to add. Also, I don't care. As for the movie itself, if you've seen First Blood Part 2, it's pretty much more of the same. It's yet another big dumb action movie with the one-man wrecking crew that is John Rambo. There's barely a plot to speak of and you won't find any character development here. They also gave Rambo a child sidekick of sorts and it's as lame as it sounds. But if you're somehow still sticking with the franchise at this point, you don't care about any of that. You're just here for the explosions, and the movie is happy to oblige. Hell, there is more than one instance in this movie where Rambo kills people and then blows them up after they're already dead. Why? Because he can. It's ridiculous and over the top, but it's actually kind of entertaining in its own way. And it's not like the movie doesn't have its bright spots. Take this moment, for example. I'm sorry I got you into this, John. No, you're not. You know what? He's absolutely right. Troutman's not sorry. Troutman wanted him to come on this mission in the first place. And he knows what a mess Rambo is. He should know he created him. He's Dr. Frankenstein and Rambo is his monster. And he knows exactly what seeing all of his friends killed before his very eyes in Vietnam did to him. And he keeps trying to throw him right back into that shit. Forget the Soviets. Forget the Viet Cong. Forget Sheriff Teasel. Troutman is the real villain of the Rambo franchise. I am not a crackpot! I certainly would not call Rambo 3 a good movie. It's bad. But the third act is all kinds of stupid fun. And that's more than I can say for Cocktail. The closest that movie gets to fun is a bunch of drunk people singing along to Robert Palmer's Addicted to Love. So I definitely put Rambo 3 above Cocktail. Besides, it's hard to hate a movie that gave us this line. Who are you? The worst nightmare. So thus far, the case for Cocktail being the worst picture of 1988 is still holding up. But there are three more nominees to look at, and they ain't getting any prettier. Next up, we have Caddyshack 2. Believe it or not, the original Caddyshack, with Harold Ramis in his directorial debut, was not all that well-reviewed upon its initial release, and even Ramis did not consider it to be his best work. But over time, it has gained a cult following and is now considered by many to be a comedy classic. Personally, it's not one of my favorites, but it does have its moments. I mean, when you put Bill Murray and Rodney Dangerfield in front of a camera and just have them go nuts, it's hard not to have fun. Caddyshack 2, however, was a complete waste of time. The laughs are few and far between, and it is a chore to sit through. Murray and Dangerfield both chose to skip this one and were replaced by Dan Aykroyd and Jackie Mason, playing similar characters except, you know, not funny. Aykroyd, who won Worst Supporting Actor that year, was annoying as hell, and Mason, nominated for Worst Actor, is clearly playing a character written for Dangerfield, and it's just not working. It was an ugly girl. She had a coming out party, they made her go back. <laughs>
The script should have gone back. Only Chevy Chase agreed to reprise his role from the first film, a decision he would later regret, and he did his best, but the script didn't give him much to work with. Ramis, who co-wrote a first draft of the screenplay, was so embarrassed by this fiasco that he fought to have his name taken off the film, but the studio refused. Poor guy. In the end, it's a terrible comedy and a far cry from its predecessor. As for how it stacks up with Cocktail, I personally disliked Caddyshack 2 a bit more, but I could see how people could go the other way. They're bad in different ways, but they're on similar levels. Then we have Hot to Trot, starring Bobcat Goldthwait. And that's probably all you need to know, but I guess we can talk about the movie anyway. Goldthwait plays a man named Fred who inherits half a brokerage from his deceased mother, as well as a buck-toothed horse named Don. The other half of the brokerage is owned by his stepfather, played by Dabney Coleman, also with buck teeth because comedy? It turns out Don is actually a talking horse, voiced by John Candy, and this horse has a gift for getting good stock tips. Don't ask questions. There are no answers. So he and Fred join forces at the brokerage, and in theory, hilarity ensues. In actuality, hilarity takes a dirt nap. This is one of the worst comedies I have ever seen. And I've seen Leonard Part 6. At least Bill Cosby had the potential to be a leading man. Bobcat Goldthwait did not. Don't get me wrong, he can be funny in small doses, but he should not be fronting a feature-length movie. He's sidekick material at best. Originally, Elliot Gould was supposed to be the voice of Don the Horse, but after the movie didn't do well in test screenings, they brought in John Candy, who basically threw away the script and improvised all of the dialogue. And bless his heart, he tried, but even he couldn't save this one. Just get off my back, will you? What really gets me is the movie actually begins by showing us the definition of horse, because they apparently had so little faith in the intelligence of their audience that they felt they had to explain what a horse is. But then anyone who saw this in a theater willingly paid money to see Hot to Trot. So they may have had a point there. I don't have to think too hard about comparing this to Cocktail. It's worse. So much worse. Cocktail is mediocre and uninteresting, but when it was over, I didn't feel like pounding my head against the wall until I finally destroyed all memory of that film. I can't say the same for Hot to Trot. It's fucking horrible. It's easily more deserving of worst picture honors than Cocktail. Well, I think that settles it. The Razzies got it wrong. Oh, but we're not quite done. There is still one more Worst Picture nominee to talk about, and it's probably the most infamous. That film is Mac and Me, co-written and directed by Stuart Raffel, who earned Worst Director honors for this film. Mac and Me deals with a family of ugly-ass aliens that walk around as if they're constantly about to start doing the limbo. I don't know if the actors were directed to walk this way, or if the costumes just gave them a terrible sense of balance and this was the only way they could walk. Either way, it looks stupid. They somehow get vacuumed up by an American space probe, which is also stupid, and brought back to Earth. And the youngest alien, dubbed Mac, or mysterious alien creature, escapes and befriends a wheelchair-bound boy named Eric, played by Jade Caligori. And wacky hijinks ensue. Now I'm sure I don't need to tell you that this movie is a shameless ripoff of E.T., which is probably why it bombed at the box office. Everyone had already seen a much better version of Mac and Me. But it is so much more than an E.T. ripoff. It's also basically a 90-minute commercial. And it's not remotely subtle. This movie is to Coca-Cola and McDonald's what The Wizard was to Nintendo. The product placement is everywhere. Hell, there is a scene that takes place during a birthday party at McDonald's, which features people dancing both inside the restaurant and in the parking lot. It's the weirdest goddamn thing I've ever seen. And even when you put the product placement aside, the script is pretty weak. Which isn't all that surprising, considering they started work on the film before they even had a script. Raffle was basically scouting locations during the week and writing on the weekends. Hell of a way to make a movie. But there was one bright spot in this mess of a movie, and that was its handy-capable protagonist. The producers decided they wanted to cast someone who was actually handicapped in the lead role, and Caligori actually has spina bifida in real life. Mac and Me was his first and only big screen appearance, and he only had a couple of television roles afterwards before he gave up the acting life. But for someone who had never acted before, he actually did a damn good job. And the best part is, the movie never really draws attention to his handicap. He's portrayed as a perfectly normal kid who just happens to be in a wheelchair. And that's pretty awesome, especially for the 1980s. 
But that's about the only thing Mac and Me has going for it. It's pretty terrible otherwise. That being said, I would say it's actually worth watching just because it's so bizarre it has to be seen to be believed. And you don't have to watch it alone. If you have a Netflix subscription, you can watch it with your pals on the Satellite of Love. Pretty nice. Pretty nice! But yeah, the movie is not pretty nice. It's bad, and I cannot imagine how anyone could watch this movie and tell me with a straight face that Cocktail is worse. You could sooner convince me Bitcoin is a worthwhile investment. I'm gonna get so much hate mail for that. Totally worth it. So that's two movies nominated for Worst Picture that, as far as I'm concerned, are far worse than Cocktail. And with Caddyshack 2, you could make a case for a third. So how the hell did Cocktail end up winning? The Razzies have made some questionable choices before, but this just boggles the mind. There's really nothing remarkable about Cocktail except that it happens to star Tom Cruise, who, now that I think about it, also starred in Rain Man that same year. And Rain Man went on to win the Academy Award for Best Picture. So Cruz has the distinction of starring in both the best and worst pictures of 1988. Wait, is that it? Is that really why they named Cocktail the worst picture of the year? So they'd have the obvious joke of Tom Cruise starring in both the best picture and worst picture? I mean, I will admit this is kind of a long shot. The Oscar and Razzie ceremonies took place on the same day, so unless the winners somehow leaked ahead of time, they couldn't have known. On the other hand, Rain Man had the most nominations, made the most money at the box office, and had already picked up numerous other awards, so its best picture win wasn't exactly a surprise. The Golden Raspberry Foundation certainly could have made an educated guess that just happened to pay off with a lame joke. I certainly would not put it past him, but of course I can't prove it. It's just a hunch. In any case, my personal worst picture of 1988 would be hot to trot, and it's not even a contest. Fuck that movie in all of its holes. As for Cocktail, I can't really say you should avoid it at all costs, because it's really not that bad. But there's nothing noteworthy about it either, so it's not worth taking the time to see. It is simply a movie that exists, and as far as I'm concerned, that's all it will ever be. Next time, we will hopefully have a bit more fun as we venture out into space! Until then, I am the Smeghead, and I could use a cocktail myself. start at the bottom. You're aiming too high.